Okay, well, partition, and again, yeah, we did this, so I'm just going to write it down. There we have it. Okay? Now use N and M because we don't want to confine ourselves to having the same number of partitions for this one as we do for this variable, right? Okay? Although we could, it really would be okay. Just in general, it's not a good idea to write it that way. Okay? Write it more generally. Uh, just to be in the habit of writing things generally. <coughs> okay, well what's that look like? Well, let's come back to this picture. Well, let's draw another picture. Okay. So you have a bunch of R intervals, right? So let's just take this line here. Okay. There's a bunch of R intervals, right? And we don't have to have this along. You know, the polar axis can be in any direction. So if I just want the polar axis to be in this direction, it doesn't matter. Because then theta <coughs> is going to partition from 0 to 2 pi. Okay? Um, so, I'm going to draw it in a different color. These are all radial, not always hitting them. Okay? So here's your R partition, and here's the theta partition. Okay? Okay, so within this particular theta, we'll say this is theta sub i minus 1 and theta sub i, we have some. theta sub i star. Okay? And I'll put my r partition across theta sub i star, although I don't really have to. And the r, okay, I'm going to call this here r sub i minus 1. I'm going to call this r sub i. And I'll have an r sub i star sample point within this sub interval. And let me put that r sub i star in a different color so we can see it clearly within our r sub i partition, right? And within our ith partition. Ith interval of our partition, okay? Okay, well, within then, and I, I, I use I for my theta, and I use I for my R, right? So that just contradicts what I just told you to do. Fairly easy to change an I to a J. That's theta J, right? Okay? So your typical partition consists of a R interval and a theta interval. And within that theta interval, well, okay, the R interval would correspond to all points within this entire circle, right? Or this, this ring, okay? So here's the ring, <laughs> R sub N, right? Ring. Corresponding to I R interval. And then we have the circle corresponding to the R value of our sample point. Now, does that make sense so far? Okay. And then we have 
our theta interval, right? And this line here corresponds to all points that have coordinate theta sub j star. Okay? So here's our theta interval. And let's change its color a little bit. And I still got another color. So my theta sub j is here, right? Or theta sub j star, theta, or, or jth sample point. Meaning, now that we have for the ij increment, we have everything within this ring and everything within this wedge. Now we, of course, want to think of much smaller increments. That's a big chunk, and there's a lot of variability within that chunk, okay, in the, in the coordinates. <coughs> but we also have then the point Ri star theta j star. And that's this point. Okay? So there's our typical increment. Uh, you can think of a whole series of concentric rings corresponding to this part of your partition, right? And a whole series of wedges all the way around here. Well, I've actually kind of drawn those, right? But then imagine all the wedges are much thinner and all the rings are much thinner, right? So you have a large number of partitions, but I can't label a tiny increment. So here's your typical increment, okay? So now we focus on this typical increment because we're almost done. Okay? In this increment, okay? And the increment is characterized by the point Ri star theta j star. So anything we calculate that applies within this increment is going to be calculated at that sample point. We don't worry about other points. Okay? So we want to calculate the moment of inertia of this increment. Well, there are a couple of steps, as you know from physics. Okay? Like we've got to get its mass and we've got to know its distance from the point of rotation. <coughs> okay? Or axis of rotation. <laughs> um, and that's actually uh, fairly simple. So, first thing we need, if we want to figure out the mass of this region, and of course you have to have the mass to get the moment of inertia, is the area of this region, right? Well, so we want to get the mass, the moment of inertia. First, we need the area. And once we get the area, everything else just kind of falls in our lap. So what's the area of that region? R D R D theta. Remember that? <laughs> okay. I drew it out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you got that too. I mean, you, you figured that out in class. So it stuck with you, right? So, uh, and I was kind of hoping it would. So the area... And we did this very thoroughly in class. You need to look at them. You should make it back. That's not R D R D theta. You bad. Although that's what it's going to become when you do the integral. It's R sub I star. 
because you only have one R for this thing. Remember, everything goes to the sample point and delta theta sub j, delta r sub i. Okay? So that's the approximation, of course. Why r i delta theta sub j? Because you're on the arc of a circle. And to get the arc distance, you multiply the radius by the angle. Right? That's just your definition of the radian. Okay? And then you have, of course, your delta r. Right? So, again, if you've got to review that, review it. But uh, that's what you get. Okay? So the mass... is the density times the area and the moment of inertia, which I'll call delta i sub ij, because it's a moment of inertia of the ij element of this partition, right? Now, I would use a delta M for mass and a delta A for area, okay? And maybe I ought to. That would be a delta M IJ, right? And this would be delta A IJ, okay? Now, I'm going to use the words here, but it's mass times what? R, it's MR squared. What's R? R I star. Yeah. Okay? Now we just write down the integral, except we're going to write down the sum and talk about the limit because you have to be aware of that, and in many cases you have to prove it. Okay? So, we'll do that in a minute. <coughs> 